from deep in the heart. Welcome to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by Wiggle. This week, the willy or won't he saga of Geraint Thomas racing the Giro continues, as does our own saga of push-ups, and John Denkolb also steps in to save Paru Bay. Plus, at a time when bike shops are fighting hard to survive, we're going to pick out a handful of the many that we think will survive the high street retail apocalypse. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Blake of GMBN has been trying his hand at a bit of racing on the road. Although not road racing as you and I know it. No, I think this is called street racing, Dan. Although, strictly speaking, it's street, alley, steps, the odd rooftop, maybe a back garden or two. Through Grandma's front garden. Well, the official name for the event site is the Red Bull Valparaiso Urban Downhill. Full video is, in fact, already out on GMBN, and I thoroughly recommend you go over and watch it. Yeah, you'll find out, in fact, whether or not Blake was any better at racing on the road than we were. I got last! <laughs> yes, 25th! I survived, though. Well, yeah, pretty much. That's how we felt about road racing. Does ring a bell, doesn't it? Yeah, Dan, how did you get on the Tour de France? I survived it. See? Survival of the slightly less fit is how I would describe it. Yeah, right. And we also learned this week that men and women professional cyclists can and perhaps should race in the same race at the same time. Yes, this is the Melbourne to Warrnambool Classic over in Australia, 262 kilometre marathon, where the men and the women start at exactly the same time. Yeah, hats off to the winners, Nick White, who won from the breakaway, and Peter Mullins, who sprinted to victory in the main peloton. Now, last week on the show, we talked about Performance Bicycle, America's largest chain of retail bicycle stores, and the fact that, unfortunately, they're going to be closing all 104 of them at the beginning of March. A really sad end to a business which started all the way back in 1981, although rather ironically, it started out as, wait for it, as a mail order company. <laughs> that is quite ironic, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. Now, Performance Bicycle uh, is part of a larger parent company that filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, we don't know whether or not they are victims of shortcomings in the larger corporation, but in isolation, they certainly wouldn't be the only retail out that we're struggling in the current climate. No, there's an example here in the UK too, isn't there, of Evans Cycles, who've been around for over a hundred years. Uh, last year there was an emergency buyout of Evans Cycles, but unfortunately that still means it looks like at least half of their retail stores, of which they've got 62, could be shutting their doors. And that is just two examples within the bicycle industry. Of course, there are plenty more outside of it. I mean, I'm still devastated that Toys R Us went tits up not no, long ago. No, no, no. Uh, now, is it all doom and gloom though? No, absolutely not. For a start, there is Columbus Phoenix Cyclery in Ohio, which is literally rising from the ashes of a former performance bicycle store, having been opened by a few of its former employees, mm, which was, is cool. It was very cool. I was really pleased to read that. Uh, now, we asked you on social media for your favourite bike shops, and my goodness, you did not disappoint. We literally had hundreds and hundreds of suggestions from you of your favourite bike shops. I would do plenty for the local cycling community or deliver a great service or invariably deliver some amazing coffee. In some cases, all three at once. Is it possible to run a successful bike shop in the currently quite difficult retail climate? Well, we certainly hope so. And coming up are a few examples of bike shops that we think should not only survive, but thrive. That's right. We're going to get things started with one I've actually been to and thought was great. It's called The Cub House. It's based in San Marino in California, just outside of LA. Now, the reason we went there initially is because the owner, Sean Talkington, has an immaculate vintage Team Z race bike. He very kindly lent it out to us. Uh, but I was super glad that we went. Apparently, when they set out with the Cup House, the intention was not to create a bike shop, but they said that the overwhelming support from the LA bike community meant that it was something of a no-brainer. And so, although their web store with Dream Cycling is their bread and butter, they said that the Cup House more than pulls its weight. But basically then, people asked to buy bikes from them, and they now sell those bikes to them. Well, it does seem that way, yeah, which is a nice way of doing business, isn't it? Anyway, worth taking a look, great riding on their doorsteps as well. Yes. 
Our next suggestion came in from Marcus Schachabel and he has made the suggestion of the Musette shop over in Malmo in Sweden. Reason being that Musette is not just a bike shop but it's also a social hub so they organise regular weekly rides on site across mountain bikes and on the road too but they also promote local races, gravel, cyclocross and mountain bikes. So building up a strong community, serving great coffee, Seems like there's a theme here, then. It does, doesn't it? And then what about Corsa Corsa oh. over in Japan? I mean, Cannings was so excited when he even found out he was going, let alone when he made the video. That is a really interesting one, that one, because the owner has established this ultimate niche of really great quality, rare, vintage bikes. And so, although he is a bricks and mortar store, his reputation is absolutely global. So, in one case, it's kind of an extreme example of a local bike shop. But on the other, I guess there's similarities because, like many owners of shops, he's driven by passion. Mm. Yeah, it's slightly different. Now, we're also going to finish with one that's a little bit different and really interesting. Uh, it's called Dream Bikes, and they were suggested by Kingpin Ronin. Technically not a bike shop, but rather five, located in Wisconsin, Tennessee, and New York. Yeah, it's a non-profit, this one. The idea being that they take donated bikes and then employ underserved local young people. And so they teach them bike maintenance, they teach them about customer service, about retail, effectively how to run a bike shop. And when they fixed up the donated bikes, they then sell them on to the community. Oh, and they've got a mobile repair van and they fix people's bikes for free. That is really cool, isn't it? Mm. Interesting, none of the bike shops that we've mentioned today so far sell marijuana. Uh, they're not following the footsteps of Floyd Landis in his new bike shop venture. No, maybe time will tell, Dan. Can you ride bikes and smoke dope? Probably not, I would imagine. No. No, okay. I wouldn't know. Right, anyway, uh, thank you again for all your suggestions. We have, of course, picked out just four. We're not including Floyd Latinus's, that's not the fifth. But simply because we could not have listed 600 or so suggestions. Uh, but we thank you very much for making them all the same. Now, along with the hundreds of suggestions of bike shots which we had from it, we inevitably had a couple of comments which were along the lines of, this show is brought to you by Wiggle and therefore you have absolutely no right to give your opinion on local bike shops. And we get the anger directed at online, but can we respectfully disagree? Yeah, I mean, even just speaking personally, I buy online my bike stuff and some normal stuff too, and I shop in real shops, both bike shops and normal shops, and I suspect most of you are probably similar to me. Price is a consideration, that definitely affects how and where I shop, but then so too is a retail experience, so too is choice, and so too is convenience. Mm. Well, I think inner tubes are an example of price, aren't they? When you can find them online for one ninety nine with free delivery, it's then blooming hard to justify shelling out eight quid for the same thing to support your local bike shop. Yeah, doesn't it doesn't feel like service. No, but that said, there are loads of times when walking into a shop, buying something and walking straight back out with it, it was blooming brilliant. Absolutely, and let's face it as well, let's not be around the bush, price is definitely not the only consideration when buying online. There are some really, really bad online shops. I speak from experience here, I've been waiting weeks for something to turn up. And so hopefully, they eventually will die out. Yeah. The rubbish ones. But I think basically quality is quality, isn't it? Whether yeah. that's an online store or a bricks and mortar store. And hopefully that is what will shine through and that is what will survive the retail apocalypse, not either or. Absolutely. I think quality is exactly what will survive the retail apocalypse down. Uh, right, now, as we said at the beginning, we absolutely love reading through your comments about your favourite local bike shops and why they're so great. So do make sure you get involved in this comment section as well, where not only can you leave it, but you can also read other people's suggestions as well. And hey, maybe one day we will make that video of the top 600 local bike shops wow. in the world. That would be a big video. Maybe we should do 60 top 10s instead. That's a good idea. Yeah. Top ten, top 10 Local Bike Shops, episode 42. <laughs> it's now time for Cycling Shorts. We're going to start Cycling Shorts with the news that Geraint Thomas is set to race the Giro d'Italia in 2019. Why are you still going on about this? Well, Fausto Pinarello has just said that Geraint's going to race the Giro. Just to fill you in, if you're not up to date with the saga, uh, we heard a rumour some time ago that Geraint Thomas was going to start the Giro d'Italia. A rumour that he then denied, but then the Giro organisers said that he was, in fact, going to race the Giro d'Italia. Geraint denied that rumour as well. Well, he did. And then, to confuse matters, Chris Froome waded in, saying the route to the Giro was just totally perfect for Geraint this year. 
Um, and then now, here we have it, Fausto Pinarello getting stuck in as well. He's not going to ride it. I believe Geraint in when he tells us what he's not going to do. Well, in all honesty, whether he does or he doesn't, out of all the things that I'm looking forward to in cycling this year, Paris-Roubaix, Tour de France, above everything, whether or not Geraint lines up at the Giro d'Italia <laughs> is literally the thing I'm most intrigued about. I cannot wait. I must admit, it's turned into much more of a drama than I was expecting yeah. just a few weeks ago. Yeah, I can't absolutely. wait either. Yeah. Uh, sticking with racing for a little bit longer, and in fact Geraint's team, Team Sky of course, uh, rumours have been circulating as to who the sponsor will be to fill the shoes of Sky from 2020 onwards, and whether there's a possibility that it could become the first Colombian World Tour team. That's right, because the rumour has it that Dave Brailsford has been meeting with the president of Colombia and the sports minister and so whether or not there could be a Colombian title sponsor of that race of the race of the team it kind of seems a slightly odd match at first glance but then you kind of think well why not title sponsors exactly. are the title sponsors the team is already set up with a load of them, the best Colombian riders and how many fans were there at the Tour of Columbia as yeah. well? It's unbelievable. All right, last bit of racing news now. Last week it emerged that the junior Paru Bay uh, was threatened in terms of its existence because there was a budget shortfall of the race of €10,000. That, a race that has been in one in the past by the likes of Geraint Thomas. Yeah, rumour that he was actually not going to ride that year. Okay. Anyway, in steps, former winner of the senior event, John Degenkolb, putting up a quarter of the money himself, launching a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign, and boom, 24 hours later, the race is saved. What a legend. Absolutely. In fact, they're up to 15,000 euros now. That's a big prize fund, isn't it? Oh, no. Absolutely. Uh, what a great thing to do. Right, we're going to go back into the real world now, and I'm loving this news that's just come out of Melbourne over in Australia. So there, The Age have been reporting that Victoria's biggest motoring organisation have been calling for improved cycling infrastructure to go straight to the top of the transport priorities list. They basically get and understand the fact that more people riding bikes around the area means better conditions for motorists too, because there's less congestion. Brilliant. Massive news, absolutely love it. More like that, please. Like this? A picture of a repurposed underground car park in the Netherlands, complete with coffee and cake stall. Thank you very much to Cycling Professor for that one. Exactly like that, yes. Or closer to home for me, what about this one down in Southampton? So there, they have just started work on a Copenhagen-style cycle freeway, uh, which is part of a 10-year plan to improve cycling in the area. Happy days. Right, Science Next and King's College London have just published a study that shows that high cadence is of no benefit to recreational cyclists. Mm. I'm quite pleased about this one because we have often said here on GCN that self-selected cadence is often the best route and that a higher cadence is generally more efficient the higher the power. That's right. You would have thought that actually finding out the balance between force and cadence wouldn't be that hard. But hopefully smarter people than us are working on it now. Yeah. Like Emma. Yes, maybe Emma's working on it now. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we at GCN have been showcasing our collective lack of talent for push-ups. And in particular, Phil Guyman. They were pathetic, weren't they? Yeah. Guyman's press-ups. Sorry. Uh, anyway, what I found particularly interesting was this new piece of research that's just come out of Harvard University. So they found that middle-aged men I think I fall into that bracket. You do, mate, yeah. Uh, that can do 40 push-ups. Oh, no, you don't fall into that one. <laughs> no, that is true. Uh, have a significantly reduced chance of uh, getting a cardiovascular disease outcome than those that can only do 10. That's after a 10-year follow-up. You can't yeah. even do 10, can no, you? No, I can't. I was really shocked by this, actually. So apparently that's a better predictor of outcome than an aerobic fitness test. I did wonder, though, from looking at the research, whether or not the group that they've based all their research on is quite a homogenous group. So they're all firefighters. Now, I know for one that I could not be a firefighter, even though I'm relatively fit, because I'm way too puny. <laughs> so maybe, in that instance, they were like all bigger, musclier blokes. And so perhaps there is still hope for skinny cyclists, is what I'm saying. Well, I wonder if you're just clutching at straws. Like Poss there, so. A bit like clutching my arms, mate. <laughs> yes. Uh, this feels like rather an apt time, actually, to come along with my weekly vlog. Uh, <laughs> thank you, I think, to this genius suggestion from Stephen Van Imp. I I'm gotta thank him, definitely. Weekly. So, Neil, hello again. Hello. I am now... Well, close to six weeks through my 10 weeks, I've got the half Monty tomorrow to kind of check my progress. But before I do it, 
I wanted to find out what adaptations you think I have already made. What's happened to my body over the last six weeks, which has led to a power improvement. I, I, we haven't tested it yet, but I certainly feel fitter than I did at the start. Yeah, there's a few things that we look at. You know, the, the initial testing that you did with Full Frontal gives us, you know, gave us an idea of where you were as a snapshot in the beginning of January. Since then, there have been a couple of workouts that really indicate that you've been able to increase your power production for given durations, like even uh, especially that 20 minute FTP power from some of the rides that you have done. The test uh, assessment that you're going to be doing on uh, tomorrow with the with the half Monty is really going to give us a, a secondary checkup on that. It is uh, a two part test. There's a bit of a ramp in the beginning that's going to kind of ramp you up. Uh, to the point where you actually fail. We let you rest and recover a little bit, and then we go into a constrained effort, which is gonna then be constrained by your heart rate. So we wanna keep you just a little bit below your actual threshold heart rate for the half Monty and see what kind of power you produce. This week's vlog then is gonna be pretty much all about the final day of week six, which I talked to Neil Henderson about. The half Monty. So two tests in one really to see roughly where I'm at from a fitness point of view. The first being that ramp test to exhaustion, which I'm really not looking forward to. It's been years since I last did a ramp test. I've always hated them. Uh, a little bit of easy rising and then half an hour at around 95% of my lactate threshold heart rate, which for me is going to be in the region of 150 to 155 beats per minute. It's an hour and a quarter in total and um, I'm not really looking forward to it. Wish me luck. I had a bit of a false start because my TV screen kept turning off, but um, I'm now using my laptop instead. Uh, and I'm close to the start of the ramp test. 40 seconds to go in fact. Starts off reasonably easy as all ramp tests do and then goes up a little bit every minute until you can't do any more. So I um, hope you enjoy watching more than I enjoy doing it. Starting off at 128 watts for the first minute. Next step, 153. Just over 200 watts now. So the next step is 255 watts, which is what my current FTP is set at. So after that, in theory, I go anaerobic. Now 281, 306, starting to get a bit harder, 332, 357, 357. Oh. Oh. not too many more of those please, I got up to sort of the start of the level that was over 380 watts and uh, that was it, lights out. A bit of recovery now, so I've got to do a half hour interval at a bit below threshold. Let's hope I recover in time. You'll be wanting to know my results, won't yep. you? Uh, right, well let's start with MAP, maximal aerobic power, what you can sustain for around five minutes. That was at 309 watts six weeks ago. It's now up to 326, so nice work. decent rise, but not as decent as my FTP rise. That was 244 watts when I started, and it's now apparently, according to Sir Neil Henderson, up to 275. Whoa, so get very you pleased about. Hang on, that's pretty much more than was been predicted for the whole of the 10 weeks. You've done it in six, 13% improvement. Yeah, I'm pleased. You should be pleased, mate. <laughs> Whether or not I can get to 300 watts, though, is another... The way 300 watts feels right now, I don't think I'm going to get there in another Well, four weeks. who knows? With a live audience out in Mallorca watching you do it, I reckon that'll provide the extra mm. impetus. I wonder if a live audience is going to make me start off too hard. And just completely... Probably. Blow. Oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> I can't wait. Next up, it's our weekly inspiration, where you submit your inspirational cycling photos for a chance of winning one of three Wiggle voucher amounts. £100 is the top prize, you'll get vouchers to spend on whatever you want, £75 for second and £50 for third. Two ways to submit photos, firstly using the upload or a link to which is in the description below, and secondly using the hashtag GCN Inspiration over on Instagram. It's definitely a chance to win Wiggle vouchers, but for most of us it's probably just a chance to sit back and enjoy some amazing photos, isn't it? Yeah, well, we love scrolling through them. We do. There's so many submitted. Yeah, right. Third place this week has been won with this quality photo sent in by Anthony Garubba from Australia. 
chasing the sunrise. Yes. Yeah. That's we, what I'm talking about. We don't have to get up that early to chase the sunrise here. It's getting here. earlier, mate. No, it is. Ooh, well, seven, you have got a slight obsession with daylight hours 7 23 this morning, approximately. <laughs> uh, right. Well, actually, quite close to home for me uh, in second place is Phil Brown uh, in Limington out on a gravel ride. I just wow, love the angle of that shot. Yeah. Is that snow or is that water? Water. Wow. Limington's by the sea. It's not a technical trail, but I like the look of it, Dan. Yeah, that is an inspirational photo. I'd ride there. The winner this week, though, well deserving of a £100 wiggle voucher, is James, who sent this one in from Seoul. Commuting home from work, I decided to head over Namzan, a small mountain in central Seoul. When I reached the first lookout point, I looked left and was like, whoa. Yes. That is cool, isn't it? There's something amazing about getting out of a city and yep. looking back on it from a really nice bike ride, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a spot just outside my hometown, Bristol, and no matter how hard I try, I cannot take a decent photo of it. It does not look like that. Let's put it that way. It's a really nice road, but it does not look like that. Yeah. There was a point when I was living inside the M25, and one of the best moments at each <laughs> ride... That sounds really weird. <laughs> Why are you living inside the M25? <laughs> well, inside the perimeter of it. And one of the best parts of each ride was going over the M25 when it was gridlocked, and yeah. all these people stuck in their cars whilst I was out on a nice bike ride. Anyway, we digress ever so slightly. Uh, don't forget to keep submitting your inspirational photos, and there'll be three more prizes next week. We should probably reassure the viewers that you weren't in like a pipe underneath <laughs> the away. Dad, are you in there? Are you in there? I was in, in Sunbury on Thames. Woo! Next up, it's hack forward slash bodge of the week. You can submit your hacks and bodges using the uploader, the link's in the description below, or you can use the hashtag GCN hack. Yes, on um, old-fashioned social media. I love a hashtag. <laughs> First up this week, we've got this from Ruben. Started my smart trainer journey on Zwift last week, didn't have a fan the first three rides, and swept my off. I'm still looking for a fan, but thought to utilise a computer fan, turned up to 100% on my fourth ride, and it worked pretty well. Well, I don't know about that, Ruben. There's a lot of very expensive electronic equipment looking like it's within sweat distance. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. If that was me, that, that keyboard would definitely be saturated by the end, probably the screen as well. So do go careful uh, and maybe, I can't even see the fan. It must be a teeny one. Yeah, I'm gonna sort you out. Invest in a Come proper on. fan, it will make your indoor training You can buy them so online better. really cheaply, mate. Sorry, too, 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 too. yeah, a bit raw for some people. <laughs> right then, next up, we have got this one. I like this very much. Outside, the weather was horrific. Uh, my wife was out, I needed to clean my bike. How to achieve this? The kid's old paddling pool. I'm glad it's the old paddling pool, because that would definitely trash it, wouldn't it? But yeah. still, ingenious. Got to admire that. Thank we you very load... much uh, to Andy for sending that one in. We had a load years ago, didn't we, of people just washing their bikes in their showers or baths. <laughs> Fair enough, if you haven't got any outside room to do it, sometimes you clean up after yourself. Yeah, but wouldn't it be bad to clean up? You're getting the grouting. Oh, yeah. Braver men and women than I. Uh, right then, what's up next, Dan? We've got this from Robert in Shropshire. Uh, used, I used a lathe, should I say, to make a wooden plug with one that would fit into the head of my crank arm compression bolt and opposite end that would attach to a ruler. Uh, this meant that I was able to accurately map my saddle height difference between bikes. Hack or bodge? Hack! I think yes. that's amazing! I mean, it's it quite, quite like nerdy, dumb. but I like it very much because that, you know, that's one of those jobs, isn't it, where you're like, oh, is that 775 millimetres or 774 and a half millimetres? And with that bit of kit, you could definitely work it out, couldn't you? Yeah. Genius. I have found since I have no longer been professional that I'm not quite so bothered about exact saddle height. When you hit 300 here. watts, you will, mate. <laughs> For sure. Right, Samuel uh, sent this one in. Uh, on a recent ride, I realised that I can save a whole chunk of money on ceramic speed oversized jockey wheels. I'm not entirely sure you get the same performance benefits, but that is quite something. I've never seen that before. <laughs> wow, that must have been a cold old day on the bike, was it? Was the jockey wheel even turning at that point? Uh, I doubt Definitely it was, wasn't was it? saving four watts. No way. Bodge. Uh, right, next up we've got another local one to me in the New Forest, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, I damaged the disc brake caliper and didn't fancy sitting in my bank holiday traffic to take the bike into my local bike shop. Oh dear. Uh, so I put a trailer on and towed it down to the forest gravel tracks. So he did go to his local bike shop. Hooray! Yes. Brilliant. To be fair, I like that trailer very much. That looks like a that looks like a hack, yeah. Yeah, doesn't it? Uh, well, there's somebody a couple of weeks ago was looking for this exact solution for their child's bike. So, uh, well, there you go. Towing a bike with a bike. Brilliant. Uh, right, last one now, and I like this very much. Sent in by Seth Frankel on old fashioned social media, Dan. Uh, old chisel smoothed over for a super thin disc brake piston tool. 
pushes both sides of the pistons for even pressure. There we go, new life for old tools. That's almost a hashtag in itself, isn't it? Yeah, hack. Hashtag new life for old tools could, could be applied to any number <laughs> of things, couldn't it? Anyway, make sure you keep them coming in. We love your hacks and botches. It's now your chance to win a GCN Camelback water bottle with our caption competition. Last week's photo, this one of a pair of Katusha riders, and we have got an absolutely <laughs> brilliant caption in as winner this week. Ah, oh, God, can I read this one out? This was sent in by Al Lee. Caption, you distract Sagan, Al Pacin is bid on. <laughs> Very good, Al Lee. Uh, get in touch on Facebook with your address and we'll get that straight out too. Never has there been a more deserved winner. Of no, a absolutely water not. Can we, do we need to explain? Alpacin, team sponsor, makers of shampoo. Yeah, we probably didn't need to explain, but thanks for doing that. Just to clarify matters, <laughs> right. nothing like ruining a joke by over explaining. Yes, this week, um, well, it's nothing like ruining a joke for you saying it really. <laughs> Uh, this week, uh, the photo is this one of Chris Room over at the Tour Columbia with a security guard. Come on, mate, you better say this one. So this is the security guard, just to explain this joke. <laughs> Geraint said he still doesn't want to do the Giro. Did you get it? Anyway, well, if you can do better than that, leave your captions in the comments section down below and hopefully we'll get another genius response. <laughs> We're about to tell you what's coming up on the channel over the next seven days. But as per usual, we're going to pick out a few of our favourite comments from the yeah. previous seven. Starting with John Bicycle. I suspect Mark from GTN would have run it faster. This being the Col de la Madon challenge uphill. And you're probably right. Yeah, we did a bit of thinking about that because it's a very good point. And actually, he probably could have run it faster. 10Ks, climbing a thousand metres. At current rate for you, that would have been a close run thing, <laughs> would wouldn't it? would have been really embarrassing beating my runner. Uh, to be fair, when I raced him, it was blooming close. I mean, literally, it was a sprint finish down a hill. Was it? Yeah, well, I remember it was. That in the cyclocross event, or run bike versus runner. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, moving on to the next He's comment. He's a fit lad. So, uh, this from G Unit, one oh, yeah. under the same video. Steve Jones is a brave and confident man offering to buy all the beers for Dan. Yeah. Uh, he was, yeah, and I really took advantage of it that Brave year, slash confident slash wealthy. <laughs> well, he was wealthy, not anymore. Uh, right, underneath the video uh, about how to ride in a pace line, uh, Will Baker said, was this film the day after Ollie did his Everesting? Poor boy, look. Looks like he's blowing out of his inner tube. It's funny you say that, Will, but yes, it was the exact day after Oliver did his everything, and he was indeed suffering so badly. It was brilliant. And I mean, finally, that, yeah, this brilliant. from, I've got no idea, uh, but the comment is, where did Tom Lars go? That is a good point, Dan. We have been looking for him far and wide. We're not entirely sure where he is at the minute. Lasty? Lasty? Are you here? Right then, coming up on the channel this week, on Wednesday, we've got the dark side of cycling, how to beat your mates when you're out on a ride. Some good and tips there. Then on Thursday, Hank's gonna let you know the 10 essential items that you should have in your saddlebag. And Friday, as ever, it's Ask GC Anything. Yeah, on Saturday, I have been fascinated by this one. What is actually the difference between the entry level Zwift setup and the bells and whistles Zwift setup. So what does it mean practically and also what does it mean actually in terms of the feel on Zwift? So that'll be super interesting. And on Sunday, Ollie went to meet the guys from the Who What Bike team that defied the odds effectively to become the fastest track riders on the planet, basically, haven't they? It's yeah. An incredible story. Almost there anyway, like the giant killers, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, Monday, of course, the racing news show and Tuesday, back in the set for the GCN show. We shall finish the show, as ever, with Extreme Corner. And this week you are going to witness one of the best downhillers, if not the best downhiller of all time, Nico Vulwas. I thought you were going to say you for a minute there. Yeah, and me. I tell you what, it's like that guy is incredibly smooth on the bike. I mean, the stuff is so rough, and he makes it look like nothing. I guess that's probably why he won ten world championships. Yes, he he's might be really blooming good. Yeah, uh, right. I can Cracking video, that, that cracking video. Right, we got a little bit of news from our shop. Actually, uh, we have a mega offer at the moment. One of these super cool looking Camelback Eddie bottles. 
is up for grabs for free every time you buy a GCN fan kit. That's cool. pretty cool, isn't it? It is, yeah. So head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. We'd like to take advantage of that offer. Uh, that's the end of this week's show. We'll, of course, be back this time next week. If you haven't watched my descending video with Vuloz, you can find it just down here. It's over on EMBN.